think a lot of times when it comes to scriptural exegesis, a lot of times people get on board a ship and they sail off somewhere, never to return. In order to have sound doctrine, you've got to look within the book itself. And I think I was saying yesterday afternoon about going, you, know, go, you go back to the garden, if all things can be understood from let us make Adam in our image <clears throat> to the fall. And as I've, I think, <clears throat> coined the phrase uh, altering the blueprint of humanity there afterwards. And when we talk about things that pertain to what God intended, we're not only looking at the past, we're also looking at the future. As we study in Revelation, there are cues of things that may not be the most important parts of the book. Some are just concerned with, you know, when will the Battle of Armageddon or, or who will be alive or who will be here. Some are only concerned with these items here and others are going to look for every single piece of information they can glean to get a whole picture. And that's what my hope is. I, I've read and seen too many snippets of things which leave you with more questions and more baffled about things than answers. So it's almost better to just kind of go bit by bit to see how whatever God had designed in the beginning, He ultimately will complete in the end. There will be, it will be the way God intends it to be. What has happened in the middle may not have been the intention, but He enters into it. He has entered into it. So we know Paul writes in Romans, the wages of sin is death. And that seems to be a no-brainer that back there in the garden, the price of that death. And he goes on to say, but the gift of God, which is a free gift, it cannot be earned, it cannot be bought, is life eternal. That's Romans 6.23. And he goes on to say in the eighth chapter about the whole creation groaning in travail. And such as we are in travail and constantly until we shall be what we were intended to be in the process, it's the struggle of life. So when we get into the book of Revelation and certain things I'm going to discuss tonight, it's important to understand that a lot of the symbols that we're going to encounter are not new symbols, and in fact they encapsulate the whole idea of what I'm calling the beginning and the end, that these things are not new and they're not intended to stimulate us in some way that says, wow, this is the spectacular, but rather that in the repetition we see God through and through essentially repeating and unfolding a little bit more, a little bit more clarity comes. So let me start with this. We're going to look at something in the sixth, uh, maybe the fourth chapter to start off with of Revelation. Yeah, let's start in the fourth chapter. Uh, <clears throat> as I pointed out yesterday, and I wanted to make it clear about the elders because I think there's a tremendous amount of confusion, <clears throat> especially if you read commentaries, there's lots of speculation on who the 24 are. I really don't think understanding who the 24 are is as important as understanding that these were redeemed and these are alive before the throne. That's probably more important. Equally in this passage, there's the reference, we're in the fourth chapter, the reference to the four beasts. And I pointed out yesterday, these four beasts 
um, I'll write English for you. Zoan from Zoe. We get our English word for uh, zoology. We get our words for life. Now, I, I had to make sure I was doing this right, so I'm to borrow my piece of paper here. In Revelation, you've got references to the four zoon, but you also have two other types of words. These are all being translated into English by beasts, beasts, plural. The first one, though, we encounter in the fourth chapter, zoan, living creature. The second word, which we'll encounter elsewhere in Revelation, is, and I'll try and write again uh, phonetically for you, thirion. Um, also being translated beast, and you'll find that this is related to for example, what comes out of the bottomless pit, or in the chapters that are describing the beast, in we'll, we'll use it as a more pejorative way. And then there's a third word that occurs just one time, uh, kitinos. Well, how do you do this? Kit kitinos. Okay, I said I was going to write English, and that really it is English though. It occurs one time only, and has to do with just beasts, as in sheep, cow, whatever, just beasts. So King James, though, used everything beasts. And why is this tragic? Because it, it destroys the understanding of who and what these living creatures, fourth chapter here of Revelation, the four beasts full of eyes before and behind, sixth verse. And the first beast was like a lion, second zoan like a calf, third zoan living creature, face as a man, fourth zoan was like a flying eagle, and the four zoan each had six wings, full of eyes within, and they are part of this group that is around the throne worshiping. Now what's interesting is if you keep following through, uh, you'll encounter them again, uh, for example, in verse 11, chapter 5, verse 11, I beheld and heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts, the Zoan. So there's, there's a dis a distinction between angels and these living creatures. And I hope to try and make this a little bit more clear as I get into this. And we keep encountering these four living creatures. They're part of what I've called the heavenly worship team. But then into the sixth chapter, you'll notice what happens when it says, I saw the Lamb open one of the seals, and heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, come and see. One of the four, come and see. And of course, he sees the white horse and the rider. And to verse 3, when he'd opened the second seal, I heard the second beast. These are the same as the four that we were just talking about in the fourth chapter. First beast living creature, second living creature saying, come and see. And of course there's the red horse. And then we have the third living creature in verse 5. And you can see, I heard the voice in the midst of the four beasts, a measure of wheat for a penny. And if you keep reading, when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, come and see. So these speak. They speak. They can speak. They've got a strange appearance. They can speak. They are essentially, each one of them is unveiling each of the horse and rider or the depiction of 
what we've called the four horsemen of the apocalypse. If you keep reading, you'll encounter them periodically along with the 24 elders worshiping. But then something happens that's a, just a little bit different. Um, in chapter 15, one of the four, verse 7, one of the four living creatures gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of God who liveth forever and ever. So not only are they part of this group that is worshiping, and not only part of the come and see, the announcing, the unleashing, the, the event as the Lamb is opening up the seals, they are saying come and see, but they also are one of the four at least, gives to the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of God. Now hold that thought for a second. Because I said sometimes we need something to confirm and we need a little bit more clarity. These are not just living creatures now. We need to have a little bit better idea. So you first want to look at a little bit better idea of what we're looking at as um, this may seem out of order to you, but it really doesn't matter to me, and the, the impact is really what I'm going for. Um, in Ezekiel, the opening of Ezekiel, Old Testament, and I'm not so much concerned with the fact that these uh, similar-looking creatures appear in Ezekiel, although that's important, but there's some other thing that's said by Ezekiel that clarifies something about these living creatures. Ezekiel chapter 1, the word of the Lord came expressly unto Ezekiel the priest, the son of Buzi, in the land of the Chaldeans by the river Chebar. And the hand of the Lord was there upon him. And I looked, and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud and a fire enfolding itself. And a brightness was about it, and out of the midst thereof, as the color of amber, out of the midst of of the fire. And here we have verse 5, also out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures. Now he's going to describe the four living creatures, but if you keep reading, you're going to find that he says in here is these four living creatures. He describes them as cherubim. Keep reading. Every one of them had four faces, slightly, slightly different than Revelation, but bear with me. Every one had four wings, slightly different perhaps there as well. Their feet were straight feet. Sole of their feet was like the sole of a calf's foot, and they sparkled like the color of burnished brass, and they had the hands of a man under their wings on their four sides, and, their, and they four had their faces and their wings, and their wings were joined one to another. They turned not when they went, they went everyone straight forward. As for the likeness of their faces, the four had the face of a man, the face of a lion on the right side, and they had, it's very strange, four had the face of an ox on the left, and they four also had the face of an eagle. So kind of an interesting conglomerate, if you will, of what, we've, what we know we've read of the description of these in Revelation 4. Thus were their faces, their wings were stretched upward, two wings of every one were joined to another, and two covered their bodies. And now it's describing how they went. The likeness, as for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire, and like the appearance of lamps. It went down, went up and down among the living creatures. The fire was bright, and out of the fire went forth lightning. And it's kind of interesting that when you read in Revelation, you're going to hear voices and sounds of thunder and lightning. And these things seem to follow these living creatures as well, just kind of a footnote. Um, and then here, you know, there begins this strange appearance, the appearance of wheels, and their work was like unto the color of a barrel, 
And just if you keep reading, there's a, there's a lot of strange things here, rings and things that are turning. Living creatures went, the wheels went by them. And it says the, the likeness of the ferment upon their heads of the living creatures was like the color of the terrible crystal stretched forth stretched forth over their heads above. Let me see what that says. Uh, 122, I've got the, the Hebrew and NIV open here. Curious to know, they say here, it's a terrible translation, I guess, sparkling like ice and awesome. But when you, you keep reading, you find out that Ezekiel says these uh, living creatures are none other than cherubim. How do you know that? <clears throat> In Ezekiel 10, and beginning at verse 20, and you can go back and you can read the rest of what's there, but he says, this is the living creature that I saw under the God of Israel by the river of Chebar, and I knew that they were cherubims. Don't think little angelic babies wearing little pieces of cloth covering their loins. And this is what I want you to really think about, because I, I, sometimes I think, and even I succumb to this, I can caricature in my mind, I can think of images I've seen, illustrations by people like Dore or others who then that becomes the image that you keep in your mind. But what's just described here when he's calling these living creatures, which by the way the Septuagint of this passage is calling Zoan as well, living beings. So it's interesting, we, we know the same imagery is here. What's important about this is that immediately my mind races back to the garden. And to prevent Adam from eating from the tree of life, which would have frozen them, kept them essentially in an eternal state, they would have stayed essentially eternally damned. There would have been no hope of redemption had they eaten from that tree. There are cherubims placed there to keep man out and to keep man out from partaking. It's kind of interesting, this imagery that is thread through and through and specifically in Ezekiel because in this particular image we have the glory of the Lord departing from the temple and the imagery of wheels. I can, in my mind, as I've read through the passage over and over again, I can just almost see you know, don't think UFO, but think, think of this as the departure of essentially going back to wherever these came from and no longer being at this place that the glory of the Lord should have remained at. And we know that the rest of uh, Ezekiel has future time events where the book ends with this is where the new city and the Lord is there. But the glory of the Lord departs, and these essentially are the, the departing event. So when we see this image that John is seeing in what I've called the master control room there up in heaven, it shouldn't be like we're looking at separate entities. It's the very, to me, it's the very understanding that these were here at some point. These were actually here. It says the Spirit of God and the priest of God, Ezekiel, saw these things, and he also saw the glory of the Lord departing. And these are part of that glory that was there. And if you keep on track with the concept of these being close to God, you almost have to start from the garden. And as you travel through God giving the revelation to Moses to build the tabernacle, and the ark, and the ark, of course, then eventually is placed in 
the inner sanctum or the Holy of Holies, that sacred place where the glory of the Lord would fill the room and what sat on the top of the mercy seat, these, what we'll call the then closest understanding of what cherubim may have looked like because God gave the pattern to Moses. But as you progress through the temple, Solomon's temple, by that time, it's pretty clear that no one really had an idea, no one had clarity of what it actually, what these might have actually looked like. Forget about the description we're reading. It wasn't like they could open up the, the book and say, well, Ezekiel said. Uh, but what I'm trying to say, even somebody like Josephus makes a note somewhere as an important footnote to say, by a certain time, people didn't know what the cherubims actually looked like. They had some vague idea. The Talmudic commentators perhaps gave some idea, but all we have is the references we have between Ezekiel and um, what is in Revelation. And perhaps if we want to entertain what might have been, we know the crowning image of Lucifer uh, in Ezekiel 28, the image that he had, the, the beauty that he, as chief and crowning musician, what he had before he fell. We read that passage. The important thing is to say at some point, man no longer had the ability to identify, to describe, to define. But peppered through the book, you'll find wherever these images are attached, they're attached in close proximity to the presence of God. When you go into Herod's temple, the time of Herod, they no longer had a fabric. They had painted them on the wall, and it was a vague idea of what they might have been talking about in terms of the description. So what's important is we do have a description here, and we've got the idea that these are in close proximity throughout the book to God, obviously from the garden all the way to the close of Revelation. We have some idea. I think what's equally staggering about this as I read this is it gives me great clarity that the living creatures we're looking at in Revelation are not John's uh, imagination. They are not a, a, a creation of some fantasy. It's like God has said, if you want proof, you keep going back and you keep looking equally what is described in a strange way by Ezekiel, two different ways of their images, what on one side, on one side, on one side. In Revelation, how they are described, how these living uh, creatures are described, uh, like as a lion, like a calf had the face of a man, and the fourth like a flying eagle. Now, it was Arrhenius way back there that put out the uh, what has become common for people to teach. Dr. Scott taught it, that these symbolize, each one of these symbolize the gospel. It was originally propagated by Arrhenius. I'm not saying it's error whatsoever, but I do suggest that you take just a little bit different look at something, and I'll tell you what it is. When you read in Numbers of how God in Numbers 2 says, order the standards of each uh, of the tribes, rather than trying to explain it, let me read it. In Numbers 2, Numbers 2, on the east side, Numbers 2 and verse 3, on the east side toward the rising of the sun, shall they of the standard of the camp of Judah pitch throughout their armies. We know that Judah is, is the tribe that is always equated to the lion. First beast, first living creature, was like as a lion. Bear with me for a second because I'll explain something that I feel is symbolism 
that's just as important as anything else here. If you keep reading, so that was on the east side. On the south side, verse 10, shall be the standard of the camp of Reuben according to their armies. And Reuben was typified in his standard as the symbol of a man. You can go check me out for that. Got plenty of Bible elsewhere to prop up what I'm saying. And on the west side, verse 18, the standard of the camp of Ephraim, who is often typified in, in, their, in its standard as either a calf or ox. And the standard of the camp of Dan shall be on the north side. So we've got north, east, south, west. The north side of the camp of Dan typified in its standard by the flying eagle. And what's in the middle? The tabernacle and the presence of God. So I said to you, you can't, you can't start reading Revelation without looking in to see how God has so carefully made sure that we're not just randomly pulling things out of a hat. So these living creatures in Revelation, like a lion, like a calf, face of a man, like the flying eagle, like what Ezekiel saw and what Ezekiel was seeing when he was looking at these, he was also seeing the glory of the Lord depart. They were around the Lord. They were encompassing the Lord. Where are they in Revelation? Around the throne. So, so I said to you, we have to be very careful in treating the scripture and making sure we're not, we're not creating spectacle out of what God has already laid out as a template and, and has not changed. I, there's many places I could confirm this from, but I think if you're reading through and through, you see you can find the patterns there. And what's interesting about these living creatures, if you remember, I just said referencing the cherubims placed there to guard the tree to keep man away from the tree of life. We're going to find that the final act, not the final act of these living uh, creatures. The final act will be in chapter 19 where they are singing praise with a whole host, a myriad number innumerable, innumerable. But the last act, if you will, of carrying out is bringing, of these one, is bringing the um, vials of wrath to be poured out, delivering these to the seven angels who will pour out the vials of wrath. And so it's somewhat interesting how when we are looking at this, it's almost like God is given to these not only the honor to be in His, in His presence, and obviously the announcement, come and see, for each one of these where the Lamb is opening the seal and each one of these horses is coming out revealing a new phase, if you will, in, in the final period of time, but equally how these will participate in the worship and ultimately the delivering, if you will, of the container, the contents, the fullness of wrath that will be poured out. So um, sometimes I think we read through passages and we don't really, we don't see the value of looking and investigating at each, each one of these uh, who are around, who, who play a vital role. But the key that I want to point out, which I think I've made abundantly clear, is that you can go straight through the Bible and find how God confirms something. This is why when uh, between what was told to Moses and what the writer of Hebrews reports, see to it that you build it exactly according to the pattern. There was a reason God wasn't just so, hey, listen, you know, I'm, I'm watching you, better do it like this, and, and the details revealed, the, how many loops and how, how high and how long and how wide and how much. And it mattered to God because what He was revealing to Moses, just like what He revealed to, for Ezekiel to see, 
are the things that are yet and do exist, but we cannot behold them, we cannot see them, we will not see them until we are with Him, until these things are revealed, unfolded, but they are, and they're through and through. And so I'm just asking you, if you're like me, and you've kind of put a little bit of a, I want to call it a caricatured spin, I'm asking you to go back and read carefully because even these living creatures tell you about, even though we've got the one who's sitting on the throne, and we have the Lamb, and we have the triune God, we have another confirmation of those that are in God's presence, physically in God's presence, by the presence of these living beings who we know at the beginning were with God, who we know throughout the camp wandering through uh, 40 years, journeying through the wilderness, through just keep going on till you get to here and you see they just didn't disappear. They are yet with God and they will play a vital part th straight through to the end of this book. Now, what does that have to do? Is that gonna, is that gonna make or break anything? No, but it's gonna help you understand the details of this book are very important. Um, I would like to point out one other thing because I gave you the examples of the words, um, these Zoan, Therion, and uh, Katinos. If you're interested in knowing, because you're going to read and you're going to find these words popping up, anytime you find the reference to the four beasts, four living creatures, Zoan, the rest of the time, except for one reference, the only reference that is that singular Katinos is in Revelation 18, 13. And all other references that aren't re referring to four or one of the four are therion and have a, as I said, more pejorative, evil connotation in the representation. So that just hopefully makes something a little bit clearer. Um, now, I don't know that your life is going to be radically changed, but I would say this. It's quite amazing to see once you start putting these pieces together and you start following, um, you know, you get into the 144,000, which I'm also wanting to talk about, not tonight. You start to see a lot of interesting things that probably the details are minute but they're pretty darn important if you're wanting to know exactly what all this means, not just, you know, God has written this book which people have twisted and rested and done all kinds of things with. Let, let God confirm His own Word, and then you find out that there's a lot more clarity between the lines than you could ever have reading a thousand commentaries or somebody who's got some great ideas that would be great for a movie, but they help you with nothing to understand how God has not changed from cover to cover. And the imagery and the symbols that are here, pretty straightforward, they go straight through the Bible. So I hope you'll stick around as I do some of these smaller studies. They're not the big word studies, they're nothing complicated, but they do bring clarity and they show you how amazing it is that God has preserved these patterns and types straight through from cover to cover. Now, I'm taking your reservations and your commitments. Get on the telephone.